Yeah, so I'm Malachi. Uh, Malachi, and this is Obi and Fuad. And Obi and I are from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Um, but we used to be at the Genome Center in Vancouver. So we're at two of the other genome centers other than this one uh, in North America that are all, you know, have a lot of similarities. Uh, and Fuad is in Toronto at the OICR. Okay. Is that good enough? Yeah. Do you want more info? Okay. <laughs> okay, so the usual preamble. I guess Francis or Michelle probably went over the sort of Creative Commons uh, philosophy of these courses. Um, so our this workshop that you're going to do over the next two days is actually um, part of uh, a quite a large a set of materials that we're going to review that are all available online. So we have the, the course wiki, which is providing you sort of basic information about the, you know, this class and the schedule and things. This RNAC uh, workshop has its own wiki on GitHub, uh, and everything that you'll see and much, much more is all available there uh, that you can peruse later. It's all available under, uh, also under a Creative Commons license. And we'll kind of go through that, that wiki and give you an introduction and sort of uh, oriented to all of the materials that are available there. Um, so we're going to skip this, what we're calling Module Zero, which is an introduction to cloud computing, because you guys have already been introduced to the cloud, and you've been on uh, AWS. Uh, and we're just going to jump straight into Module One, which is the, uh, the introduction to RNA sequencing. The learning objectives of this module uh, are basically to go over the theory and practices of RNA-seq analysis. Uh, and that includes some background sort of rationale for why you would do RNA sequencing in the first place. Um, so who here, just sort of a rate show of hands, who's doing RNA-seq or planning RNA-seq in the near future? Wow, everyone? Okay. That's well, why we're here. I see. <laughs> we are also doing DNA-seq and things too, so the other modules were also, I assume, very relevant to some of you. Yep. Who is only interested in the RNA-seq, kind of? I mean, you don't have to like, okay, so that's interesting. Okay, so everyone does RNA-seq, uh, so the rationale will be rather pointless for this crowd. Um, you guys obviously are all on board with it. Uh, but uh, I guess you also have to face some of the challenges that are specific to RNA-seq, some of which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Uh, we're going to go over some of the general goals and themes of RNA-seq analysis workflows. You'll probably get a sense by the end of these two days that there's a ridiculous number of bioinformatics tools uh, and sort of proposed uh, workflows or pipelines for doing, doing RNA-seq analysis. We are just going to show you one example, which is kind of a popular one, uh, but it is sort of chosen from among many possibilities that each have their sort of merits uh, and disadvantages. Uh, and the hope is that the, the skills that you learn will be sort of generally applicable to developing your own analysis strategy uh, when you get back to your own labs. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about where to get help outside this course. So we'll, you you know, use this time wisely and ask us all of the questions that you've been dying to ask about RNA-seq or specific problems that you have with your type of data or whatever species you're working on, uh, but you only get the two days, so we'll talk about some things that you can do uh, after those two days. And at the end of this introduction, we'll talk about the, the hands-on tutorial a little bit, uh, which will start sort of right after the intro lecture. Uh, so this is probably all really review. Sorry, that doesn't display that great. It's okay. Um, uh, but just to sort of orient ourselves uh, by reviewing the central dogma here. Um, so this is a depiction of a simple gene model uh, with three exons and two introns uh, and a promoter region and a polydenylation site. Uh, so this is genomic DNA. Uh, this thing gets transcribed uh, into single-stranded pre-RNA molecule that still has the introns intact, but now we have an RNA molecule. And there's various uh, features on this molecule that uh, govern the way the splicing machinery removes the introns and stitches the exons together uh, into a mature mRNA. Uh, this thing is really the subject of a lot of uh, RNA-seq analysis, uh, either mature mRNAs or uh, small RNAs that uh, won't be polydenylated or ribosomal RNAs, which may also not be polydenylated. But a lot of RNA-seq is focused on these mRNAs. Uh, but it's important to remember that we're never really actually sequencing these things uh, exactly in RNA-seq. Uh, so we're converting RNA to cDNA, uh, and then for most species, the typical length of uh, a transcript is much larger uh, than what can actually be sequenced by RNA sequence. So we're usually fragmenting cDNAs uh, and actually sequencing little pieces of these things 
uh, and then trying to assemble or align them in such a way that we can infer what the full length structure of each RNA looked like. Uh, and that is a very difficult problem. Uh, and then, of course, a, a lot of this has to do with uh, the actual protein, uh, which if we could sequence it directly, we might do that if we could do it in a high throughput fashion. But there just simply isn't a way to do that high throughput. So RNA-seq is kind of a proxy for looking uh, through the window at what is happening at the protein level in, in a lot of experiments. It, you know, some people are specifically studying RNA biology, and, and then they don't have that uh, extra layer of sort of inference uh, or projection. So this is just a simple depiction of uh, an RNA-seq workflow uh, at a really, really high level. So we're going to start with some samples of interest. So it could be a tumor normal pair, or it could be de uh, developmental tissue stages, it could be uh, drug treated versus untreated, uh, whatever it is that you're studying. Uh, and we're going to isolate RNAs from those. Uh, and then often we'll do a poly A selection, uh, but not always. There are different enrichment strategies that try to uh, enrich for uh, RNAs that we'd like to be sequencing, depending on what our strategy is. Uh, and then we're going to generate cDNA from that RNA and fragment it. Sometimes the order of those things is reversed. Uh, there will be some size selection step to get fragments that are kind of in the range that makes sense for RNA sequencing, uh, adds uh, linkers or sequencing adapters, and then basically sequence the ends of these fragments from each end inwards. Uh, and that produces uh, these RNA-seq reads that are shown here in a paired form. So there's sort of a, a blue read one and a red read two. Uh, and then there's often some uh, little piece in the middle of the fragment that we didn't actually sequence because the two reads didn't meet in the middle. So there's some amount of unknown insert sequence. Uh, and the size of these fragments usually ranges a fair bit. So they might be in the range from, say, 250 to 500 bases. So sometimes the two reads will meet in the middle and sometimes they won't. Uh, and sometimes there'll be uh, a different strategy where you only actually sequence from one end. Uh, the length of the, the sequence can vary depending on how you run the instrument and so forth. Uh, but at the end of the day, you get basically a FASTQ file which has uh, your raw read data in it. Uh, and that again, that gets aligned uh, against either a reference genome or a reference transcriptome uh, or some combination of those things. Uh, and the alignments feed into a lot of downstream analysis. Any questions on that? Yes, or probably. Okay. So uh, maybe kind of a naive question, but so if you wanted your data to include uh, small RNAs, like micro RNAs and things like that, is uh, the random text mark finding rather than uh, the poly A capture good enough to get broader collection of RNAs in the data? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, so, so the question was whether uh, random hexamer priming was a, kind of a better alternative to poly A selection if you're looking at, at small RNAs. I guess I would kind of separate those two things a little bit. Um, when you generate these cDNAs, um, I would I, generally people use random hexamers to cr do the cDNA synthesis reaction. Um, and that's sort of separate from whether or not they've done a poly A selection of the RNA upstream of that. Um, but sort of the sort of the bigger Pandora's box that you opened with your question was relating to small RNAs in general, uh, and there's quite a quite a different strategy to creating a library for small RNAs compared to sort of mRNA seq, and it's, and also there's a whole separate suite of analysis strategies and tools. And we're not going to talk very specifically about small RNAs, unfortunately, although we would love to add a component that really dug into that. Um, but yeah, generally, if you're, if you're really interested in microRNAs and other small RNAs, you should really think right from the beginning about a customized strategy for creating the library and doing the analysis. And the sort of cut point that people tend to use is in the range of 100 to 150 or smaller is sort of considered sort of special RNA-seq libraries. And everything that's over 150 to 200 basis is sort of regular RNA-seq. And it, and those strategies do a really great job, actually, of capturing everything from a 150 or so up to as big as they get. Um, and you will still get some signal from smaller RNAs. It's almost impossible to eliminate them completely, but there's usually this sort of split path there. Uh, and some people are actually taking it further and having sort of a really small RNA-seq, like the microRNA libraries, and then a sort of medium uh, RNA-seq library strategy that's in the kind of 50 or 75 to 150 range, sort of, so the small, medium, and large strategy. And I think that's still kind of an area 
that's being experimented with, like whether you need to do that. Because there is there's a feeling that the we've gone down this road of optimizing for microRNA sequencing and optimizing for mRNA sequencing, and there's sort of some orphaned sort of medium to small sized RNAs that are getting, getting lost. Um, but that area, I think, is still quite novel in terms of capturing those things effectively. There's not well-established protocols yet. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so why sequence RNA uh, versus DNA? I originally created this slide because I spent a lot of time talking to DNA people at genome centers that really like, well, sequence the genome and learn everything. Uh, but there are some things that are a lot easier to learn by studying the, the transcriptome. Uh, and of course, functional genomics would be right, right at the top of that category. So there's a lot of uh, biology that's happening at the level of RNAs where the genome may be constant, but some experimental condition is resulting in a change in gene expression. So this could be things like a treat, drug treated versus untreated cell line and so forth. Um, another thing that's really great about RNA-seq is that uh, predicting transcript sequences uh, from the genome itself is very difficult, and this used to be sort of a whole field of bioinformatics was trying to look at the genome and predict what transcripts would look like. Uh, and now we can basically just sequence the transcriptome directly and align it back to the genome, and that is just way, way easier. Uh, we don't really understand it entirely or even very well at all how uh, transcription is, is regulated uh, by the features of the genome. So it's a lot more uh, effective to just sequence the transcriptome, align it back, and then think about how regulation is occurring rather than trying to anticipate or predict uh, what is happening based on our current sort of incomplete picture of how transcription regulation works. <clears throat> uh, and then there's some molecular features that really can only be observed at the RNA level, so things like alternative isoforms, uh, fusion transcripts in, in tumors, for example. RNA editing, of course, can only be observed at the RNA level. Um, another application that has been uh, used quite, or starting to be uh, more popular is interpreting mutations that, that don't have an effect on the protein sequence, so looking at basically regulatory mutations. If you sequence a genome and you see that there are mutations there, you also sequence the transcriptome. It may actually help you interpret the functional relevance of mutations in the genome. Uh, and then uh, sort of related but simpler application is uh, actually prioritizing the protein coding somatic mutations. So this is really a cancer application where you find a bunch of mutations and they're inside uh, exons of known genes, so you can do some kind of interpretation as to what their effect might be. And if you overlay transcriptome information on that, you can also tell whether the mutation is actually expressed in your tissue or not, and sometimes that can have important implications for the, the relevance of that mutation to uh, perhaps a disease that you're studying. So there are a number of challenges to RNA-seq that uh, generally are much less of a problem for people doing DNA sequencing. Uh, these include uh, purity, so the sample purity, that, that issue could apply to DNA as well. Uh, quantity, of course, is always a problem, uh, but really it's quality that people seem to encounter problems with, with RNA compared to DNA just because RNA is uh, so much more fragile than DNA. Uh, another problem is that RNAs consist of small exons, at least in eukaryotes, uh, that may be separated by large introns, and this creates uh, an alignment challenge. So when you're sequencing reads that were derived from the genome, you have a little piece of the genome, and when you align it back to the genome, you expect it, for the most part, to align as a single contiguous sequence, uh, and that we don't have this expectation for RNA. So we have an RNA sequence that many of the times a read will span across two exons, and then when we align it back to a reference genome, we have to resolve uh, that exon intron exon structure uh, to figure out how it fits against the, the reference sequence. Um, so that, I guess that leads me to another question. How many people here are working on, say, human as the, the species they're doing most of their research in? Okay. And, or any eukaryote. And not a eukaryote, like bacteria or yeast or, well, yeast wouldn't count, but bacteria or, okay. Any plant people? Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Too bad for you. Uh, do you have um, Do you have genomes? The plant people have reference genomes. Okay, well that's good. <laughs> Anyone not have a reference genome? One. Okay, so I'm sure we'll be talking about that at some point. 
Okay, so another problem uh, that's uh, somewhat particular to RNA sequence is that the, the relative RNAs vary widely. So, again, when you're sequencing the genome, you have uh, some number of chromosomes in your species, and they're there in some expected copy number. So in human, you have uh, chromosomes that are there uh, diploid, so you, have, you expect two copies of each. Uh, so when you sort of shotgun sequence a human genome, you have this prior expectation that everything will be covered at a kind of approximately equal level. Uh, because there's two copies of all of the things that you're sequencing. Uh, in the transcriptome, of course, this is not at all true. So there are some transcripts there that are present at many, many copies, thousands or tens of thousands of copies per cell, and there are other transcripts that are biologically functional, but they're at just a few copies per cell. And that creates this wide sort of dynamic range, and there's sort of different estimates about what that is, but it's sort of in the range of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 orders of magnitude between the most lowly expressed gene and the most highly expressed gene. And that creates a, sort of a huge sampling problem for us. Uh, and that's a problem because RNA-seq works by random sampling. So we're not directing the sequence in any real way. We're just taking RNA out of cells, and we're just shotgun sequencing it. And we're basically pulling reads randomly out of a hat. Uh, and the problem that this creates is that when we pull, keep pulling these reads randomly out, we tend to keep getting the most highly expressed things over and over and over again. So if our gene of interest is something that's really highly expressed. This is great. We don't need that much data to get good coverage of that transcript. But if we really want to characterize the whole transcriptome or we have particular interest in certain lowly expressed genes, uh, then this is a big problem because it's going to take a lot of sequence depth uh, to get good coverage uh, on those transcripts. Uh, and th this is something that you know people are usually uh, maybe surprised at this, how bad this problem is at first. So the, the transcriptome you know, on its face seems like a kind of small space. So in human, for example, it only occupies one or two percent of the transcriptome. So you might think, oh, it won't take that much data to cover the transcriptome. Uh, but this basically kills that idea. Uh, it's, it's almost like sequencing a genome uh, because of this issue. Is that also your assumption that <coughs> when you compare, like, uh, disease versus control or, or tumor versus normal tissue, <coughs> you assume uh, the, uh, the, the amount of expression is proportional to the, the amount that you detected, right? Yeah, so, so that's I, why it's, it's by random acceptance. Yeah, you do assume that, and I think that you're kind of edging towards a sort of area of analysis that's you know, called uh, data normalization, which deals with potential biases between your two samples that aren't related to the biology that you're studying and that you want to correct so that you, when you do compare them, you can see differences that are related to biology. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but it, it's also in itself kind of a big topic. Just thinking, uh, where do you place, like, for instance, uh, um, extended procedures, uh, cDNA subtraction, for example, to, if you don't need quantification, you can go to rare constructs easily by subtracting out the yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question or, or point that you raised. There, so there are a number of, of wet lab strategies that attempt to uh, address this problem by basically normalizing the, the varying levels to try to basically pull down the really highly expressed things and pull up the lowly expressed things and put them kind of more on a, an even playing field uh, and sort of even out the number of copies for each. And there are quite a number of strategies uh, that have been used over the years. This goes back to uh, like EST sequencing, cDNA library construction, uh, where different strategies involving different types of hybridization would be used. Uh, and there are a bunch of enrichment strategies that also kind of get at this. So the sort of the simple, the, the, the most prominent one is that ribosomal RNAs occupy something like 95% of all transcripts. So of course, almost every RNA sequence library construction strategy involves trying to remove the ribosomal RNAs, and then there are additional strategies that you're still left with really, really highly expressed genes and really lowly expressed genes, and there are other strategies that try to further even that out. Uh, and if, you're, if your interest is in just annotating the transcriptome or just detecting sort of presence or absence uh, of certain transcripts, um, that might be a really good strategy because you can get sort of broader coverage across the transcriptome uh, without as much sequencing. And the sort of, I guess, the fear, the reason why people don't always want to do that is that you'll lose information about how highly expressed each transcript is relative to other transcripts or that you'll introduce bias. Um, and that is a, is a real concern. I think 
probably even more of a concern is, or it's less of a concern because it's actually really, really hard to do a good job of normalizing the library. You, it's very difficult to actually get to a point where you have even representation of all your transcripts. Usually you've just kind of like pushed it a little bit uh, in that direction and you still have a quite, quite wide range. Um, another uh, issue that's kind of particular to RNAs is that they come in a wide range of sizes. So we've already talked about small RNAs a little bit, um, and, but just generally the idea that you have, you're measuring these things all at once by the same technique, uh, but they each have different sizes, and because you're randomly sampling them, there's sort of a bias towards the things that are bigger, because it's easier to derive a read from this big sequence than it is from this small sequence, so you sort of have to take that into account when you're thinking about the relative abundance of uh, transcripts. Uh, and it also introduces some uh, wet lab issues. So for example, if you're doing a poly-A selection, um, so it, to get rid of ribosomal RNAs, as mentioned here, you want to, a lot of people will select for poly, polyadenylated species. So they basically uh, hybridize their RNA to oligo-DT in beads or on a column, uh, and then they wash away everything else, hopefully mostly ribosomal RNAs and then you're left with these polyadenylated enriched for messenger RNAs on your column, uh, and then you make your library from that. Uh, so one of the problems with that is that for long RNAs, there's a, the longer the RNA, the, the greater the chances that it will get broken at some point during the creation of your RNA or the handling of it. And then when you grab onto the three prime end of it, the poly A tail of it, you basically will wash away the five prime ends of transcripts. And the bigger the transcript is, the more likely that is to occur. Uh, so it's really typical to see in mRNA-seq libraries this 3 prime end bias where you tend to have better coverage at the 3 prime end of genes than you do at the 5 prime end and there's just, it generally tails off as you get to the 5 prime end uh, and the bigger the transcript is, the more that uh, problem is, is an issue. So speaking of quality, sort of a, an industry standard way of thinking about or interrogating the quality of RNA-seq libraries is to use this Agilent uh, nanoassay, uh, which produces a, an RNA integrity number or RIN number, uh, which is on a range from 0 to 10. Uh, so here, who here is, is familiar with these, these traces or electrophorograms or whatever? Okay, so about half of you, I guess. Um, so we provided a, a large number of examples to give you kind of a reference point that you can download. Uh, but basically the idea is you're, you're effectively running a gel, uh, but through a, a capillary. And then you're reading out uh, the sort of fluorescence of nucleotides as they pass a detector over time. Uh, so you get this readout that is basically small things come out and then over time uh, larger and larger things uh, until you get up to you know, very large uh, and then you stop the assay uh, and you look at this trace and you use it to sort of estimate the amount and the quality of your RNA. Uh, so showing, shown on the right here, this is some RNA that I isolated from a cell line, uh, which is basically perfect. Uh, and what you see uh, when you run total RNA that's a very, very high quality, that's totally intact on this assay, is two large peaks that correspond to the, the ribosomal RNA peaks uh, for your species. And based on the height uh, and relative uh, size of these two peaks, you get uh, a prediction of the uh, quality of your RNA. So this is a perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, and then as your RNA starts to degrade, you start to see secondary peaks. So basically where the RNA has been broken into pieces, you start to get uh, peaks on your, your gel, so to speak, that are at smaller sizes because uh, the size of the RNAs are being broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. So you start to get uh, what look, would look like a smear on the gel, but here looks like all of these extra peaks. Uh, and this gets uh, basically translated into a score that tells you that there's some amount of degradation. Uh, and as the degradation occur continues, this trace keeps moving further and further into the left until it all kind of piles up uh, sort of at the, the size where RNA degradation starts to not happen as much, which is sort of in the range of like 100 to 200 bases. On the y-axis? The y-axis is basically just the intensity of fluorescence. So you basically have a dye that's fluorescing that's bound to the RNA molecules. Uh, so it tells you basically how much RNA there, there was at each size range or over time. Yeah, so that's a good point that um, 
I think we're going to show a picture of it, but yeah, one of the following steps that after you isolate RNA is often to fragment it. Uh, so maybe uh, we don't care. Um, and that, you know, to some degree is true. Um, there's just, a, there's sort of a few gotchas. One is the one that I just mentioned about doing a poly-A selection. If you have degraded RNA, then you probably really don't want to do the poly-A selection because you're going to introduce this bias towards things that are close to the poly adenylated end of transcripts. Um, the other is, I, I guess, a, a worry that the degradation that's happening in your sample is non-random, uh, and that will introduce some bias, perhaps. Um, but generally, as long as it's not too degraded, sort of degraded below the size range that you would ideally want to make your library, it, it can be not a big deal. Um, but ge So generally, you will have some loss of smaller RNAs getting broken into pieces that are then kind of un below the size range that you're selecting. And then when you make your library, you may have a, a size exclusion step that throws away small stuff, and you may lose some signal from certain transcripts. Um, but yeah, it's not the end of the world, potentially. Yeah. But would you be concerned sequencing something with a min value of six, for instance? Um, yeah, so the question was, would, should you or would you be concerned um, sequencing a sample that had a RIN value of six, like in this example? Uh, people are definitely doing it. Uh, a lot of sort of core services will set a cutoff that they feel allows them to robustly make a library that ultimately sort of meets their quality metrics, and that cutoff is typically eight, um, which is pretty conservative, I would say. I I think that this is you know this is probably fine as long as you're as long as you're making the library the right way. So as long as you're doing you know random CDN, hexamer cDNA synthesis, you're not doing a poly selection. Um, you will probably be able to get pretty good data um, out of libraries that are degraded to this level. Another thing to really think about, though, is that, yes, you can make a good library or one that's reasonable, but if you have a, an exp a, sort of a project that has 10 or 50 or 100 samples and there's a lot of range, so some of them look like this and some of them have a RIN of 4 and some of them have a RIN of 10, that's probably a problem. But if they're all six. But if they're all six, it's probably, yeah, you'll probably be fine. I would, I would, it wouldn't stop me from doing my experiment, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you first. Okay. Uh, will you be uh, concerned if you are interested in uh, finding a uh, differentially dispersed gene when you do a uh, poly A uh, uh, sequencing? Will it be a concern to do poly-A selection if you're looking for differentially expressed genes? I mean, uh, most of the people that are doing mRNA-seq are often looking for differential expression. I think it, as long as you do it consistently across the samples that you want to compare, then it should be fine. Um, but, it, I mean, it also is sort of related to my last comment. You probably don't want to do it on some of your samples and not others and then try to compare them. It, it needs to be consistent. Uh, but I think if you have good quality intact RNA, total RNA, and you're interested in messenger RNAs, things that are going to be protein coding maybe, um, a lot of people are, will still do the mRNA-seq just because it reduces the amount of sequencing that you need to do. Um, it's really the most effective way at removing the ribosomal RNAs. There are a lot of other strategies that work okay, uh, but you do wind up having to sequence a bit deeper, so it's sort of a cost consideration. Actually, the question comes from, uh, uh, I read one uh, in a documentation where they do uh, sec, sec tech, where they just sequence the first few nucleotides uh, starting from the 5 and 5 prime end or the 3 prime end, and that's it. Yeah, so, so this... Really intended for differentially expressed. Yeah, so you're referring, there's, so there's a lot of different names for this, there's, you know, GIS, SAGE, CAGE, uh, various types of tag sequencing. Um, so the idea is that um, if you're only interested in differential gene expression, um, you can make the cost of sequencing a lot lower by really just sequencing one tag or one index per transcript. And so there's different strategies to basically create a library that just has the five prime most 25 bases or whatever and those get, either you sequence them, uh, you can sequence them on an Illumina instrument with a very short read length, so you make a library, then just sequence 35 or 
36 or 42 or 40 ba 50 bases and that allows you to save reagents and to get basically more sequence out of each kit that you buy from Illumina. Uh, and then you can multiplex a lot of samples. So if you have a, a lot of samples or a lot of biological replicates and you really just care about differential gene expression, uh, then you could, yeah, you could do one of those strategies. Um, the sort of the one downside is that um, you lose the ability to do all of the other analysis applications beyond differential gene expression. Um, and you know, you might think that you don't care about those things now, but you might change your mind later. Um, definitely, like as someone who does analysis all of the time, um, I usually advise against uh, collaborators or other people doing those kind of really sort of end sequencing strategies because it's usually about five minutes after I get the data and like start looking at the results that they immediately ask, oh, well, how about alternative splicing or can you tell me what the expression level of this SNP is or this mutation or can you look for gene fusions? Basically, they immediately start asking a lot of questions that can't be asked because of the way the data was generated. So the, one of the great things about RNA-seq is that it's this really sort of hypothesis-free, unbiased shotgun of the transcriptome and there's just this galaxy of questions that you can ask of the data after the fact just starting with the same data and you sort of all of the information is there and it's just like a matter of mining it out um, which is why it's so much better than SAGE and other techniques that have been around for much longer. You had a question? Uh, so there is no known bias to a degradation like this, uh, like that. Yeah, I haven't heard. Um, I, I mean, I guess it would depend on why that, why or how the degradation was occurring, perhaps. But um, it's yeah, it's probably random, and it's probably similar. I mean, it's often the well, not often, but some of the the RNA fragmentation strategies that you would deliberately do to the RNA involve the use of RNases, which is the thing that you would worry about de degrading your RNA naturally. Um, so there's obviously a, people that are not worried about the unbiased nature of the way RNAs just break things down. Okay, so we've talked, actually kind of talked around these issues quite a lot now. Uh, design considerations, so of course when you're at the, the beginning of your project is when it's a good time to think about how you want to design your RNA-seq experiment and there's many, many considerations. And we're going to sort of talk about a lot of those over the next few days. And we've talked about a, a few of them already. Uh, so there's things like how many replicates should I include? How much data should I generate? Control experiments, spike ins, reporting standards, etc. Uh, and there's been a few organizations, and we'll, there's a resources section on the wiki that covers uh, others of these. Probably the most comprehensive one that I've seen is this ONCODE RNA seq standards document that was produced. It's quite a while ago now, three or four years, and is a very extensive list of the kinds of things you should think about when you're setting up your RNA seq experiment in the first place. Uh, and it's basically a, a list of everything you should do, but that no one actually does. Um, but you should yeah, think about doing some of those things that are recommended, uh, because they you may sort of thank yourself later for including spike in standards or uh, you know sequencing to a certain standard depth and so forth. Okay, so we've also talked quite a bit about this, so different uh, RNA uh, library construction strategies. So we've talked about uh, starting with total RNA and either uh, continuing on with some kind of total RNA-seq strategy or doing a poly-A selection. Uh, and then sort of related to that is whether you do a, a riboreduction, so you usually do one or the other. If you're doing a poly-A selection, you might uh, not do that, but if you're not doing a poly-A selection, you would definitely want to do some kind of riboreduction strategy. Uh, size selection. Uh, is pretty common, uh, and this can be done to create a small RNA library, or it can be just to con constrain the fragment size of your cDNAs before making a library out of them. And there's several reasons why you might want to do that, um, but one of the main reasons is that um, when you flow molecules across uh, an alumina flow cell, uh, it's easier to optimize the density of clusters on that flow cell if the fragment size is relatively uh, consistent. So some people will select a rather tight size range for their RNA-seq libraries. So they'll say, okay, it has to be between 300 and 400 bases, and I'm just going to try to like cut everything else away uh, that's either too big or too small. Uh, for people that are doing things like uh, tumor sequencing, there's sometimes you have so little material that you're doing some kind of amplification. 
Uh, so one strategy is a linear amplification. Uh, yeah, question. Just a quick question. What, what are some scenarios in which you would choose bravo reduction over polygate selection? Uh, so the most obvious biological one is where you're, whatever you're studying, your biological question involves non-polyadenylated RNAs. So there's a lot of RNAs that are, have biological significance that aren't polyadenylated. Um, bacterial genomes. Yeah, bacterial genomes. Um, the degradation issue that we already talked about. So if your RNA is degraded, you don't want to do poly A selection because it'll introduce end bias. Uh, but generally, the philosophy is just that it's more, it's a more complete view of the transcriptome. So you're removing the ribosomal RNAs because they just take up too much of the sequence. They're you know, 95 to 98% in human. Um, but otherwise, you want to have this idea of sequencing the whole transcriptome, whatever is there, and sort of you know, analyzing it after the fact rather than sort of imposing this upfront limitation that the RNAs have to be polyadenylated. But there's sort of a cost trade-off in there, that you're basically taking a wider view of the transcriptome, so it takes more data to, to cover that wide view well. Um, stranded, we're going to talk a little bit about stranded versus unstranded libraries. It's becoming very common to use uh, a stranded library. And basically what this means is that you can tell what strand from the genome the transcript was transcribed from. Uh, for the last, you know, the first three or four years of RNA-seq, pretty much all of the libraries were uh, double-stranded where you didn't actually know the strand that each read came from. You could infer it, often with high accuracy, but um, there wasn't any molecular biology that told you which strand was being transcribed. So you were basically sequencing both strands, aligning back to the, the reference genome, and then trying to infer what strand was that each read was likely being expressed from. Uh, but now this is sort of built into the library construction where you can, uh, the reads are encoded with which strand uh, the read came from. Um, so this relates to the, the comment uh, that was raised earlier about normalization. So there's a couple different normalization strategies. One that's becoming fairly common is to actually uh, create your RNA-seq library and then hybridize it to an exome reagent uh, and use that to basically enrich for fragments that correspond to the exomes. Uh, as a way of also, it, so it basically focuses your reads onto real genes that are actually being transcribed. It can uh, be a way of cleaning up um, RNA-seq libraries that were made from a really poor quality sample. So this is a common strategy for um, FFPE material, for example. <clears throat> and then there are other library normalization strategies. Uh, and so there's a lot of detail in here. The, the sort of broad, important thing to think about is that all of these things can affect uh, your analysis strategy, uh, especially if you're comparing between libraries. So you don't want to really vary any of these things uh, between the libraries that you're ultimately going to be comparing to each other as much as possible. And this next slide, wow, which doesn't display very well even though that's a PDF, um, shows kind of a, a depiction of some of these ideas. Uh, so what's shown here is a sort of gel electrophoresis of RNA. Uh, showing sort of the, the gel version of that trace that we sh saw a few slides ago where you have your two ribosomal RNA bands uh, and then showing sort of the idea of like as, as degradation occurs you get these additional bands that are smaller and the worse the degradation gets the smaller they get uh, and then when you select um, from the total RNA you select polyadenylated RNA say from perhaps intact RNA you get sort of this mRNA smear that tends to look kind of like this uh, and there's sort of a lot of steps in making the library, and it's, it's sort of typical to keep evaluating by uh, these Agilent traces. So starting with the total RNA, you look at the quality of your total RNA, uh, and then uh, you do a DNA's treatment often, and some kind of enrichment strategy where you try to enrich for mRNAs, or you try to remove the ribosomal RNAs, and then a cDNA synthesis step happens, and you still have this mix of sort of different sized molecules. And then a size selection or exclusion will often happen where you're basically picking sort of a tighter size range. And there's kind of two strategies that are common. One is sort of just throw away all of the really small stuff. And the other is to basically run your library on a gel or use an instrument that simulates that and cut basically a very tight size range. Uh, and that's sort of what's depicted here. You have this size selection or just size exclusion. 
And the main difference is that you get a bit more of a, a tail of large things uh, when you do the excluding just the small stuff versus actually specifically picking a band of a certain size. Um, and then you wind up with uh, basically the subject of your RNA-seq library that's going to be uh, have linkers added to it and will get sequenced. And at this step, you're, you're usually losing your small RNA. So if you want to do small RNA sequencing, you're going to have to basically capture these guys and produce separate libraries from the really small RNAs. And this is just a depiction of some of the, the different uh, consequences of different enrichment or depletion strategies. Uh, so you start with your tissue and, and again isolate RNA and you have this mixture of, of RNA types and total RNA is sort of the we have everything. Uh, but the problem with it is that we have a lot of total RNA, so we are sort of our library is dominated by reads that stack up on this on this ribosomal RNA, for example. Uh, and then you could, so you can do things like riboreduction, where you remove uh, that overrepresented ribosomal RNA, and it kind of allows you to focus in on the uh, mRNA transcripts that you're interested in. Um, a polyase selection sort of does that even more, but it tends to give you less signal from you get like a cleaner result more of your reads are focused on the exons. You have less intronic reads, less intergenic reads. Uh, and then cDNA capture kind of has a similar effect, uh, but allows you to sort of achieve that without actually doing the poly A selection, so you don't have to worry about this, introducing this end bias. And then the sort of depiction of the stranded versus unstranded libraries. Uh, at the top here, we're seeing an unstranded library where the, the strand information is encoded by the color. So red is positive and blue is negative, for example. Uh, and this is sort of what RNA-seq data has looked like typically for, for many years, where you have this mixture of reads that are from either strand. Uh, but because they're all uh, aligning to known uh, genes or transcripts in this case that have known transcription directions, we can infer what direction these reads probably came from. Uh, but now with the strand-specific libraries, you actually get that information being encoded. And we're going to visualize some RNA-seq library. And if you uh, sort of activate the right view in a genome viewer like IGV, uh, it'll basically tell you how each read was tagged. So basically what strand the read sort of believes that it came from. Uh, and those will, again, be colored uh, blue and red. And you can see that they, they work out pretty, pretty consistently that the reads that uh, are colored blue tend to correspond to a transcript that was being transcribed in this direction, and then the reads that are colored red seem to be overlapping perfectly with a, a transcript that was trying to transcribed in the other direction. Okay, so now I'm just going to go through, a, through a, a few common questions, some of which we might have already covered, uh, and if, if so, I'll just skip them. Uh, one is sort of the, the idea of replicates, so how many replicates should I do, and this doesn't really have anything to do with RNA-seq uh, per se, uh, it's more of just a broad biology thing. Of course, you should include biological replicates. Uh, that is sort of, there's no way around that. RNA-seq doesn't make biological variability go away. Um, but the idea of technical replicates sometimes comes up. So do I, should I trust uh, if I have RNA-seq data from one lane and I have RNA-seq data from another lane for the same sample? Are those things equivalent? Do I need to worry that there's somehow some bias related to those two lanes? Or say I produce some data on one flow cell this week, and then next week I realize that I want more data from the same library, so I sequence another lane worth of data on a, a different instrument or a different flow cell. Uh, should I trust that data that it can be pooled together safely? Uh, and the short answer is yes, that generally the Illumina platform in particular at this stage has sort of reached a stage of robustness and consistency that the technical variability from lane to lane or flow cell to flow cell, as long as there's no serious problem with the run, is really, really high. Uh, and this is just an example of, of two lanes uh, being compared to each other uh, with very, very high correlation. Um, that's It's typical. So people don't usually do those kind of technical replicates. Uh, so in, in that ENCODE uh, document you referred to, uh, you wouldn't recommend that you need a spike in anymore that they, that they refer to? The spike in I would recommend. Yeah. Okay. So, but I would, I guess that would be, I would consider that kind of different from the kind of technical rep replicate I was just describing. But I would definitely say if you uh, include those spike ins in all of your libraries, that is really, can be a really nice thing to evaluate the quality of your data over time. And you can use them for normalization. Um, yeah, they're a really good idea. Uh, they increase the cost a little bit of each, each sample that you run. But 
They're highly recommended. Sorry, why you put spike? Since now you're saying that the reproducibility, technical reproducibility is pretty good, but why you put spike? I, I don't get that. Yeah, so the spike in, yeah, so I guess it, get, it comes back to what you mean by technical rep reproducibility or technical replicates. So these, the technical replicates I'm talking about here are really like instrumentation related. Um, and so the spikins would help you evaluate that, but the spikins go right into your RNA. So they evaluate the reproducibility of the whole process. So making the libraries, doing poly A selection, all of those things still, I think, benefit from an evaluation of reproducibility. Um, it's only really at the like instrument level, like two lanes that I was referring to. So that's yeah, that's a great point. That yeah, the spikins they they give you an idea of the robustness of your whole end-to-end -end process. So we spike our spike. So yeah. Example, we put a spike in, and we freeze it, and store it, and process it, and make sure we get that back. Yeah. Then we have another spike we put in after processing. So that should help you detect things like, you know, different operator making a library a different way, making a mistake, or batches of reagent enzymes and so forth that, that vary over time, these kinds of things. Yeah? But even though you're not concerned that there's a difference between flow cells and lanes, et cetera, do you still control for it in your downstream analysis, like in a routinely kind of way, or is it just, or have you just decided that you're not concerned that um, yeah, so, so the question is, um, yeah, so the question is basically, do you, even though you're not, even though I'm not concerned about these lane-to-lane -lane technical replicates, do you still build into your analysis procedures some concept of evaluating the quality anyways, just in case, I guess, something went wrong? Um, and I think that the answer to that is yes, because you, because you can automate those kinds of checks, that why not? Um, so a lot of, so for example, when we process RNA-seq data, um, we process it lane by lane, and then the results get merged, and then you move to the next step. So it's really easy to say, okay, at the end of each lane by lane uh, alignment, produce a quality report and summarize that at the lane by lane level, or sometimes it's even more than that because you have multiple samples in the same lane with indexes, so then it would be at the lane slash index level, you basically have a piece of instrument data that is uh, at most one lane or a part of a lane if there was indexing, and quality would get assessed on each of those pieces before they get merged into the, the final result. Um, and sometimes it's not an issue, depending on your experimental design, you may mostly just have one lane uh, for each sample, um, but you definitely want to think about QC. Um, of the, the flow cell, the instrument, um, in case you're, in case you don't realize that you're basically introducing batch effects to your your project overall. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna have we have a couple QC components in the hands-on tutorial, and there's a quite a wealth now of tools to help you evaluate QC. And some of the some of the metrics we'll talk about are, are quite particular to RNA seq. So we'll try to review those. Um, Here's a quick question on replicas. What happens when you have the uh, uh, undesirable situation of comparing replicates across multiple platforms, but coming from the same sample stream? And you may have spike nets. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I, don't, I don't think that I've done like ion torrent versus Illumina. I don't think that we've don't do done it. much of that. <laughs> <Don't do it. laughs> There was a question at the back, too. Yeah, so the, the question is, if you have bad samples, how, yeah, how do you decide to throw it out? That is, that is a really hard question. Um, there seems to be like a very strong tendency to not want to throw out data, no matter what. And this happens at every step. So. Um, we looked at the RNA integrity numbers and things like this, and people try to say, oh, if it's RIN less than 6 or less than 8, then we shouldn't do it. And everyone agrees, yeah, that seems reasonable. 
but then when it comes to it, you've spent all of this time doing your biology or growing your cell lines, or the mouse took nine months to like get that tumor or whatever. And you know, it's almost like a foregone conclusion that you're gonna try to produce the data and you're gonna try to get some results out of it. I think that, so the, you know, probably most people won't do that. They won't throw away the data unless they really have uh, an alternate or a backup, which is often not the case. So then I think that it's really just important to, to worry about and think about what the effect is and whether it's influencing your results and to try to account for it. And you know, there is quite a, quite a science to detecting bias, detecting batch effects, trying to correct for them. Um, and I think it's just, you just have to be cognizant that there may be issues. Well, you can you can do a, a basic normalization using your spike, and and that may help with some problems. Um, but I think if your sample, if you have one sample that's fundamentally degraded, or something, or it, or it was really low input amount of material, and you just didn't get representation of the tr the transcriptome compared to another sample that you're comparing to, there there may be no way to recover that. I mean especially depending on what question you're asking. So if, you're, if you have one of the applications that places high demands on good coverage and even representation across the transcriptome, say alternative splicing, where you want to like understand the ratio between isoform A and isoform B that differ in the connections of exons, if you're not getting good representation of the coverages, coverage of those exon-exon connections in one of your samples, yeah, you're not going to be able to rescue that. The, the information is simply may be missing or lost. Michelle. So we have, um, according to my schedule, we have a coffee break at 10.30 that's an error, and uh, maybe we should go until 10.30 before we coffee break, or what is your feeling? I'm fine to keep going, but you know, it's up to these, I think it's up to these guys more than me. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's the anomaly across the week, but I, I, I think we should, let's should finish. Say, Let's at least finish this lecture, which is, you know, try to get through okay. as, as quickly as possible. Okay yep. So I just mentioned this concept of, of analysis applications. So there's a lot of applications that people use, use RNA-seq data for, and to some degree it, it affects um, the amount of data you would want to produce and how good the quality of the data needs to be. So some of these that we're going to talk about uh, in some detail are gene expression and differential gene expression, uh, alternative expression or alternative splicing analysis, uh, transcript discovery and sort of genome annotation, uh, and then there are a lot of other applications that we would love to have time to, to go through, but we, we would need like a five or seven day workshop to go through, uh, and these are, include but are not limited to allele specific expression, mutation discovery, fusion detection, uh, RNA editing, viral detection, uh, and quite a slew of others as well. But uh, the good news is that all, all of these applications have some sort of broad uh, themes for the analysis workflow. Uh, and so when we go through the hands-on tutorial, you're going to get sort of an example of a, a workflow pipeline analysis for a, a couple of these applications. But a lot of the concepts will be cross-applicable to the other uh, types of questions that you would ask of the data. Uh, and they all kind of follow this sort of theme of uh, you start with some raw data, and this could be in a FASTQ format, or it could be in BAM format already. Uh, you're either going to align or assemble or some combination uh, your reads. Then you're going to process alignments. So you, at this stage, you'll get a BAM file. Then you're going to process alignments with a, a specific tool. Uh, so often the tools are specific to each of those applications. So there's sort of a differential expression tool. There's a fusion detection tool. There's a virus discovery tool. Uh, but you're going to have some tool that basically takes a BAM as input and it kind of asks one of these questions of the data. And there'll be some uh, post-processing, uh, so you might be importing it into downstream software for visualization or statistics or further summary. Uh, and then there'll be sort of your final sort of summarization, visualization, sort of reviewing the results uh, and trying to, you know, develop uh, validation experiments, create gene lists, prioritize candidates for further study, uh, and so forth. Um, and then here we have this BioStar exercise. So uh, this is kind of a long lecture, so sometimes we break it up by doing a BioStar exercise. 
Um, but first, I would like to ask who here has used Biostar before? Okay, so like maybe five or ten, of, maybe ten of you. So Biostars, for those of you who haven't used it, is uh, an online bioinformatics forum. Uh, and it really has become the most popular place to ask questions about bioinformatics analysis. Uh, and RNA-seq is no exception, so there are a huge number of uh, RNA-seq questions that have been asked and answered uh, to varying degrees of quality uh, at the, uh, on the Biostars forum. Uh, and it's sort of run by like a bioinformatics professor, and there's sort of a community of bioinformatics people uh, like uh, us uh, that answer questions there. So when we, when we leave the, the course and you have follow-up questions, uh, if you're thinking about emailing a specific question, well, we generally sort of ask that you uh, first check to see if someone has already asked and answered that question on Biostars, of course. Uh, and if it hasn't, um, ask it there. Uh, and you may, you know, feel free to send an email to give us a heads up, but we'd rather, like, answer your question sort of publicly where uh, we can avoid answering the same question over and over, and then everyone can benefit, and we can have a discussion, and other people can chime in as well. Um, so maybe just spend, like, a, a few minutes um, going to Biostars and logging in. So it's really easy to create an account if you already have a Google account or a, if there's a few other providers. You don't need to create a new account. You just log in with some existing credentials. Um, and just sort of poke around for a bit and see if sort of what kind of material is there related to your particular area of RNA sequencing. Okay, I think we'll continue on. It's been about five minutes. Um, but yeah, I definitely encourage you to sort of continue to check out Biostars when you have questions and uh, contribute if you like it. <coughs> Okay, so a few common questions that we'll just get out of the way, um, just in case you were wondering. Uh, if you weren't, you know, I'm sure it wouldn't be long before you thought of some of these things. Um, so one of them is, should I remove duplicates for RNA-seq? Uh, the reason that uh, we ask this question is sort of uh, also relates to sort of the DNA sequencing crowd. So it's become so routine to mark and or remove duplicates and DNA sequencing that some people when they start doing RNA-seq analysis just kind of they adopt their pipeline to some degree or they're just so, so used to that sort of best practice that it just seems of course I would you know mark duplicates just like or remove duplicates just like I would in uh, DNA-seq um, but actually that that's not really a good, good idea generally and it, it's generally not recommended to, to remove or mark duplicates in RNA-seq uh, and the reason for that is that uh, you have sort of different expectations. Uh, so in DNA sequencing, you have this uh, approximately equal representation of all of the regions of the genome. Uh, so you sort of have this two-copy state for everything. Uh, and you assume that if you're going to sequence your genome to 30 or 50 or even 100x coverage with paired end fragments, um, that if you have two fragments that are exactly the same, they probably came from a PCR uh, amplification artifact. Uh, because it would be very unlikely for that to happen by chance for the, a fragment to, that starts and ends at exactly the same place. It, it, it's extremely unlikely that you would get that until you were sequencing your genome to, you know, 100,000x or, or even higher. You wouldn't expect to see exact duplicates, so you remove them. Um, the problem is in RNA-seq, you don't have that same situation. So you don't have approximately equal representation of these massive chromosomes. Instead, you have much, much smaller things some of which are there in many, many copies. So you may have tens of thousands of copies of this RNA in every cell, and the RNA may only be three or 400 bases in length. So it's actually quite easy then to get a, a duplicate just by chance, where the, the same fragment is produced exactly the same way from two independent molecules. So your duplicates there are probably more likely to come from true multiple representations of that transcript than they are from PCR amplification. So generally we don't mark or remove duplicates uh, in RNA-seq. Uh, the good news is that if you do mark them, a lot of the downstream tools will just ignore the marking information in your BAM file. So there'll be a flag set in the BAM file. Say if you use Picard mark duplicates, it will mark each alignment and say, oh, this is a, is a duplicate. A lot of the downstream RNA-seq tools will just ignore that information anyway, so you probably won't do any harm. Um, but it's generally something you don't do, but it's still a good thing to think about. Um, one application where you may want to mark duplicates still 
uh, is if you're going to be doing mutation discovery with RNA-seq data, uh, and then the sort of same reasoning applies there as it would for DNA-seq. Yeah? How do you deal with PCR over amplification? Yeah, so of course that raises the, the question that um, I don't know. You don't. You, yeah, you don't. You hope that it isn't happening that much. Um, you try to limit the amount of PCR amplification as much as possible. Um, <coughs> Yeah. I think, it, you know, it might be possible, yeah, I don't know, there's not a good answer because you wouldn't want to start, you know, removing duplicates for some libraries and not for other libraries, so, yeah. I think it's, yeah, just something to be aware of that you may have issues in your libraries and that there's not really a good way to, to remove them, so you kind of have to live with it to some degree. Um, another super common question is how much data do I, this is probably the most common question, how much data should I produce? Um, I'm sure you're all thinking that right now also. Um, Can I ask one more question? You sure. Know, going back to the prior slides, where you just say assess the library complexity and decide. Yeah, so there are there are strategies <laughs> what, to... What do you mean by that? Like how, how would you do that? Sorry, what's the question? So the question is, um, what do I mean by uh, assess... Where is that comment actually? The last, the last thing. Oh, you know, assess duplicates. Well, this is so. This is just a point to say that if you are going to remove or mark duplicates, then make sure you do it like on the pairs, not it's on, on, the slide on individual. On the on this one. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think I was trying to shorten this, which was obviously uh, didn't work. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> didn't work. Um, yeah. So the, yeah, the comment is like, how do you how do you assess duplicates? Um, so I, I guess you would. You know, you would use one of the existing mark duplicate strategies and try to compare your libraries across time that were created in a consistent way, sort of similar to the comment was just raised, where and basically try to get a sense of what amount of duplication is typical and look for outliers. And I, I think there are other strategies that will attempt to look for um, amplification bias in a much more localized way. So when you have really bad amplification bias, it does kind of have a signature. So you don't just see like more data everywhere or kind of more duplicates everywhere. You see certain spots where you just have like this psychotic pileup of alignments of, that are all the same fragment that's like piled to the ceiling. Um, and so you can, you can actually see these in just looking in a, in a genome browser at your data. You'll see this sort of really blocky signature in your alignments where you just get, it, in periodic spots, you'll get just slammed with, you know, thousands of copies of exactly the same fragment um, that is disproportionate to the level of coverage otherwise in that, in that area. Um, and those are areas that just, for whatever reason, like, tend to over-amplify. So you can, I don't know, I, I can't think off the, head, off the top of my head of a tool that specifically looks for that pattern. There might be one um, that sort of looks for this, like, unusual spikiness in your data. Um, but you could definitely sort of develop an ad hoc uh, procedure or metric for finding these things. It tends to happen with about 25% higher with the product side, uh, and then when you see it, what we do is we actually think of this as products that we've seen in the past, and we just check if their numbers are related to something that doesn't tend to go nuts in the top end of our size range, either a ratio or quality. Sometimes you'll see this sort of signature as well in like the, a lot of the QC tools will do like a KMER analysis. You'll have like certain KMERs that like, so just sequence certain sequences that um, in particular libraries are very, very, very high levels for uh, otherwise unexpected reason. Um. <coughs> okay, so how much depth? Um, so I guess just to disappoint you right away, um, it's hard, you can't really say. Um, because there's just way too many factors that come into how much depth you might need. Uh, and those include, sort of one of the big ones is what you're gonna ask of the data. So what kind of analysis do you intend to do? Some, so we've already talked about this a bit, how if you're just doing, all you care about is differential gene expression analysis. You just want one number that gives you the relative abundance of each gene. That places the least demand on an RNA-seq library of, of any of the analysis applications. 
Uh, so you'll be able to get away with a lot less data. And in that scenario, you might decide that having more replicates or a larger cohort of samples gives you a lot more statistical benefit than having deeper individual libraries would. And you have a limited budget, so that's what you're going to do. You're going to have a bunch of libraries that are only sequenced to, say, 5 million reads to each. Um, but if you want to do alternative expression analysis or you want to call mutations from your data or you want to look at RNA editing, then you, that same calculation doesn't apply. You need to adjust it, adjust your expectations. Can you give us like a ballpark number? Um, so I can tell you what we do, which is basically um, one lane. So all of our RNA-seq libraries are one lane, and we find that that is pretty much suitable for most analysis applications. One sample per lane. One sample per lane. Yeah. Uh, On a high seq 2000 or 2500. So it's like 250, 300, 350 million that kind of range. That's for hu human. So yeah, so again, it's sort of, I can give the recommendation for what we do, but we do almost exclusively human work. And for yeast, it would be, that would probably be, you know, way <laughs> overkill, right? So it depends on your genome size, your, the transcriptome size, tr the transcriptome complexity. Um, so yeast is an interesting example. I mean, it's a eukaryote. And it has introns that are spliced, but by comparison to something like human or mouse, the splicing is way simpler. So it wouldn't place as much demands on um, the, the amount of data that, say, doing splicing analysis in human would. So all of these things need to be kind of considered together. And so it's very difficult to, to come up with an answer. I, you know, I can probably come up with like a, a guess or uh, instinct value if you describe your particular situation. Uh, except, you know, some areas that I really know nothing about, it would just be a complete guess, but, um, yeah. So if you have, like, one samples, like, like uh, somebody else asked, like, is, if it's degraded, you don't have enough data, but you still have the sample, do you, like, is a common practice you can add another level and uh, aggregate the data so you have enough data to... People do tend to compensate for bad sample quality by producing more data. Um, so one of the things that you'll see with um, heavily degraded RNA libraries or libraries that come from FFP material is they tend to be much noisier. So you have a lot more reads that are in the introns, that are in intergenic space that don't seem to have anything to do with transcription. Um, but there are other reads, you are still getting signal from the transcripts, it's just kind of buried in more noise. And so you can compensate in, to some degree by just producing more data, and, and a lot of people will do that. Um, and that was kind of also part of our sort of one lane for human uh, standard came from this, that you know, a fair amount of the time we're actually making RNA libraries from FFP material, and we found that one lane was still generally sufficient for for that kind of input. Um, so it was sort of a robust, like this will work 90% of the time kind of calculation. When, when you say one lane uh, per sample, is, are, are, you, are you just re that referencing to human expression, differences in expression, or are you more? So we do quite a few of these, quite a few of the these applications. So it's, yeah, if, if we just want a gene ex differential gene expression, it probably would still be overkill, yeah. for sure. But we, we always, so, a lot of our sequencing is tumor sequencing, so we're often in the position where we've identified somatic mutations in the DNA, and we want to be able to assess the expression status of every somatic mutation in the RNA. So we want, and some of those transcripts just aren't highly expressed genes, but they could be really important genes. So we want, you know, pretty good coverage across the transcriptome to give us a chance of detecting every mutation in every gene. Um, and we don't want to miss the miss that for lack of coverage. Um, so I think that uh, it's acceptable to put 40 million reads. When you say one sample per lane, it's, it sounds like huge. Yeah. So this 40 million figure. So we referenced this paper somewhere as well in the in the online wiki. They again they evaluated that that analysis only with respect to one application, gene expression. It's good for gene expression. Yeah. Basically, if you want to recreate what you used to do with arrays, it's probably 
yeah, if you want like a microarray style output, um, I think Michelle is telling us to to move along. Um, but maybe one one last question. Yeah. So the yeah no not for it, it's not for any prep. It the prep may influence. So you may if you have sufficient. RNA quality to do the mRNA or poly A selection, that will allow you to use a little bit to generate less data and get a sufficient result. But for total RNA seq, you might. Yeah, I mean, we found that yeah, one lane is fine for, we, for our total RNA seq libraries. Um, but yeah, so these two, I think these two recommendations are sort of the what you should really do, which is to think about what your analysis goals are uh, and to look at what other people have done and see how well it worked for them. <laughs> and even better than that, do a pilot experiment. So, you know, sequence maybe deeper than you would like to with a few samples and get a sense for what the result is like and then try to dial it back to where you feel like it makes sense. Uh, mapping strategy. Uh, we're going to talk about this more in the in the tutorial, so I'll just go through this really quickly. It, it used to depend a bit on read length uh, because there used to be quite a lot of libraries that or sequencing that people were doing where they had smaller than 50 base pair reads. So there were like 36 MER libraries and 42 MER libraries. Uh, this is a lot less common now, um, but if you do have short reads, the the kind of aligner you you would choose would be different. Uh, so we're going to be dealing with uh, paired 100 base pair reads, and we're going to use this bow tie top hat aligner, uh, which does a splice aware alignment. So it will try to take each read, and if it spans across an exon exon boundary, it will try to resolve where the intron is and where the two parts align to the exon. And doing that with really short reads is really really hard. So it's basically not recommended if your reads are smaller than say 50 to 75 bases. Uh, then you would use a, a different aligner. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty standard now to, to generate 100 to or even longer uh, base pair reads. Uh, but if you have decided to make uh, small or short read libraries, then uh, you would want to think about using a different aligner potentially. And we, we can talk about specifics uh, if you want. Uh, and then here's just a sort of a, a visual depiction of this showing uh, an IGV screenshot. Uh, in this case, we've done some DNA sequencing of a normal sample and a tumor sample. So this is blood and this is some tumor. And we've identified a splice site mutation here. Uh, and then we've aligned our, our we've also done RNA-seq on the same tumor sample. We've aligned those RNA-seq reads to a reference genome. Uh, and those reads span across the exon intron boundaries. So you have reads that are aligning. So for example, here's a read that aligned to the, the this half of this exon. And then the rest of the alignment continues across to the other exon. Uh, so this is the this is the kind of alignment that's difficult to do if you have really short reads, uh, and what I'm showing here is actually that you're uh, basically seeing evidence in the RNA seq data of uh, exon skipping that is caused by this uh, somatic acceptor site mutation. So the stop that in between is that an alignment error because the reference is stopping in between. How do you get that? These guys. Three yeah. mRNA. Yeah. So this so that's a, a, this really interesting question. Um, to think about what these things are and what they could be. Does anyone want to guess? Pre-mRNA? Yeah, so pre-mRNA molecules. So these are uh, where the intron hasn't actually been removed by the splicing machinery yet. So when we isolate RNA from a, a pile of cells, we're sort of catching the transcriptome in the act. Uh, and you know, it's, everything is happening all at once. So there will be some RNAs in there that were in the middle of being processed. Uh, and they still have their introns in place. That's one source. Uh, any other ideas? Could actually be, yeah, real uh, transcription. So that uh, uh, basically like an alternative isoform that has uh, a different exon intron boundary uh, is another possibility. Uh, anything else? Non-coding. Could be another transcript that just happens to be transcribed there, possibly on the other strand. So this is unstranded data, so we don't actually know what strand each of these reads correspond to. So it could be that these reads here are aligning to uh, this transcript going in that direction. Uh, and there is a, an antisense RNA that's transcribed in the other direction. We're seeing some signal from that, perhaps. 
Um, another possibility is genomic DNA contamination that's made it all the way through, uh, that wasn't effectively removed by various steps upstream that attempt to remove it. Just, you know, transcription noise. There's sort of a lot of possible sources uh, of this noise. Of course, it could also be an alignment artifact. So maybe those reads don't really go there. Uh, maybe those reads belong somewhere else. Uh, and they've been misaligned to this to this region. <coughs> uh, I think this is the last common question. So uh, I think people are less worried about this than they used to be. But when I started doing uh, RNA seq, a lot of people were very skeptical about it because it was a new technology, and they wanted to have some some sense of how accurate it was, uh, whether it was comparable to sort of more accepted gold standard things like RT-PCR or qPCR. Uh, and the short answer that it, is that it's very very accurate. Uh, if you do the analysis right and the data is of good quality. Uh, so we did this experiment where we took uh, 400 uh, candidate events from an RNA-seq analysis. Uh, so the, this first example, there was 200 cases where we'd observed uh, an exon skipping event. So we had reads that spanned across from exon 1 to exon 3, for example. Uh, and then we had a mixture of, of those reads and then the alternate isoform that includes exon 2. Uh, so we designed uh, sort of validation experiments to amplify those two isoforms that give you a sort of a large band on a gel where the exon has been included uh, and a small band where the exon has been skipped. Uh, and you could cut these things out of a gel and you could uh, sequence them and then you can uh, compare the sequence that you get from, say, RT-PCR and Sanger sequencing back to what the RNA-seq predicted. Uh, and the predictions are very good. So basically like 95 to 98% of the time, the uh, RNA-seq says this exon is being skipped, you can validate that by a more conventional RT-PCR saying or sequencing strategy. Uh, and the same thing for sort of the quantitative level of expression where you have, uh, in this case, differential expression of alternative exons or uh, alternative parts of uh, existing exons. If we compare the readout from RNA-seq on the y-axis to uh, qPCR uh, on the x-axis, uh, you get a very, very good correlation. Uh, and if you uh, apply a statistical test to sort of tell you whether both platforms said the exon was differentially expressed, you get a validation rate of about 88%. Uh, and this was based on what is now quite old uh, RNA-seq analysis and RNA-seq library strategy and sequence length. All of these things are better now. So this is really a lower estimate. Um, you can get very, very good predictions out of RNA-seq. Uh, and then the last question that I have on here is, what do I do if I don't have a reference genome? And I think since we only have one person without a reference genome, maybe we can just have a more detailed conversation uh, with that person directly offline. But uh, the short answer is, uh, one, have you considered sequencing the genome of your species? Um, 100 gigs. 100 gigs, yeah. So, yeah. Usually, the, usually the plant people have the best excuses for not sequencing their genome because the seq genomes are so big and so complicated and full of repeats and all, they have all kinds of problems. Um, so then they have like, you know, a legitimate need to like work around that and there's a, a lot of strategies. Uh, so sometimes you may not have a reference genome but you may have some vo no, notion of a reference transcriptome perhaps from cDNA libraries and then you sort of shift your analysis strategy to aligning to cDNAs and doing sort of more, you know, directed comparison against the transcriptome instead of going to the reference genome and then back to a transcript interpretation of those alignments. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's other strategies like doing uh, de novo assembly of your RNA-seq reads instead of aligning against a reference genome. Uh, and we provide, uh, we'll show you later some sort of uh, resources that go through tool recommendations and strategies for some of these edge cases where uh, you don't have a reference genome or you don't have a reference transcriptome. Uh, and that's it. Um, so. We're going to move on to a hands-on tutorial, so we're going to be logging into Amazon again, and we're going to start going through some of the basics of the command line RNA-seq analysis. We're going to install some RNA-seq tools so you get a sense of what it's like to create the, the analysis environment. Uh, and then we're going to go through uh, alignments and other things. Uh, and there's a sort of a brief lecture or a series of slides that sort of outline what will happen uh, in the hands-on tutorial, but maybe we can go through that when we come back from a, a bio break. Um, and we'll, yeah, start doing some analysis. <laughs>